and welcome back to uh, VOK for our uh, continuation of the great linear reread through A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, this episode could potentially spoil some events from the series, anything in the book, including some of the Winds of Winter preview chapters, possibly. Um, let's see. The last episode ended with Tywin's funeral on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, how fitting, in 300. In this episode, we'll be covering Cersei 3 from A Feast of Crows, Tyrion 2 from A Dance of Dragons, Sansa 1 from A Feast of Crows. And these events take place on February 15th and February 16th. And I believe in the linear fashion, uh, February is a packed month. I think that was being discussed on the forums earlier. It seems like every day there's a chapter for pretty much every day of the month. Uh, a lot's going on, I guess, which makes sense considering uh, the death of Joffrey and then Tommen. Uh, and, you know, people got to get out of King's Landing. Stuff has to go down. All right. So uh, my name is Adam. I'm also known as Drowned Snow on the forums. And today I am joined by Glenn. Hi, this is Glenn, Tycho Schreffers from the forums. Zach. Hi, this is Zach, alias on the forums. Nadia. Hi, everyone. This is Nadia. And uh, Sir Patrick the Tall, Patrick will be here uh, momentarily, I believe. We'll uh, we'll let him pop in here in a second. Let's see. Our first chapter up is Cersei Three from A Feast for Crows, and I believe Glenn is covering that chapter for us. I have that privilege. Yes, so Cersei Three um, is the day of Tommen's wedding. So modest, modest, very modest compared to Joffrey's wedding, where he had about a thousand wedding feasts and seventy-seven courses of dinner. So for Tommen, it's a, one tenth of the wedding guests and seven courses served throughout the day. Um, Cersei worries for Tommen's safety, recalls a childhood memory. Uh, Cersei argues with Jaime and states he wants Jaime in Tommen's bedroom that night. Uh, Cersei still intends to burn the Tower of the Hand in the hope of finding or killing Tyrion. And Jaime informs her that um, men and boys have been exploring the Tower inch by, by inch and have not found um, Tyrion or Varys. After Tommen and Marjorie exchange vows, many of the guests after uh, offer congratulations. Uh, Kevin is one of the last to offer congratulations, and Cersei informs um, him that she has named uh, Damien Castellan of the Rock and Devon as Ward of the West, and Kevin stalks away. Uh, Cersei enters the wedding feast and is embraced by Marjorie, and soon her thoughts uh, turn to her childhood prophecy and those distract her. Uh, Cersei surveys the wedding feast and thinks uh, she has no one she can rely on and ponders naming a new council. After the feast, a group of archers launch flaming arrows at the tower, which ignites and ignites the wildfire. As the tower burns, uh, she thinks of past hands of the king. And that's that's what I've got. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so this is, uh, I guess, you know, one of our, well, it's still an early, early chapter in the book. But um, yeah, it's kind of one of our first glimpses inside Cersei's head. And we see how crazy she is. Um, a few things I noted, like she's still, when she refers to Tommen, she refers to like uh, how Jamie is planning to protect her child, not our child. Uh, her and Jamie are kind of on the outs there. It's a little weird. And then the whole thing about... Um, she really confused Jamie about like Sir, uh, Lord Ossifer Plum was too dead, to, but he still fathered a child. I don't understand. I, I, I probably that, that that part flew over my head. Uh, Jamie talking about how there was they found like hundreds of secret passages in the Tower of the King, and some of them were you know tiny that they had to send little kids through. I mean, is the Tower of the King even structurally sound if it's all secret passages? Um, also, how did how do they not get you know? found out at this point if there's so many of them i don't know um let's see what, what did uh bina wrote, left some notes the mob must have its show there's some clear foreshadowing there um and then the obsession with maggie the frog prophecies of course who the younger queen is which you know who knows uh it's everyone according to cersei cersei's an idiot um yeah so well i want to i kind of let's interrogate that um do you do you think that she's crazy to think that it is everyone i i think actually there is you know, obviously prophecy is a weird thing to kind of to kind of parse, but I think you can legitimately make the argument that if the prophecy is as simple as a younger queen is going to come in and replace her and bring her down, there's a case that, you know, that it's applicable to it's applicable to all of these characters, you know, Marjorie, uh, Sansa and Daenerys. They they all are in some way, it seems, going to contribute to bringing right. Cersei down. So why couldn't well, they? Well, the well but I think queen? I think in the larger well, picture, not it's Danny. paranoia that does it, isn't it? Well, why not Danny? 
Uh, well, Danny would be ruling in her own right, right? Uh, Cersei is queen because she was the wife of the king. She doesn't oh, hold any sure. power. Her husband is dead. Her son's right. wife is the queen, right? But Danny, if she does take the throne, then she's 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 the ruler. So oh yeah, I'm not, uh, that's true. I th- I think it's I guess the, the only point to be made she, is this idea that you know she's she's still a queen, obviously, and if the prophecy is as simple as that a younger <laughs> and more beautiful queen is going yeah, to replace yeah, her exactly. and take her down. It's bound to say yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's so vague that you're gonna see everyone as the enemy. I mean, that that does make sense, but she's also a little bit cuckoo. I guess the more beautiful part is not you know necessarily going to happen. So right, maybe she's like, no one's more beautiful than me. Hello. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of an interesting like. It's like a weird George R. R. Martin version of like Snow White or something. You know, that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of yeah, how I yeah. picture the whole the whole mirror, uh, mirror and all that. Yeah, the whole uh, younger queen prophecy and just Cersei's general jealousy and kind of descent into madness that we see so clearly in this chapter yeah i mean how old is cersei uh, at this phase in the books like 32 I think. 35 30s 30s probably yeah i'd say like 32 to 35 somewhere yeah like this that. says she was born in 266 so she would be um 34 oh yeah yeah, yeah. so that's right that is and all right. possible younger queens that people suspect it could be are half our age right so is this um Let's see. So with Lady Merryweather, is this kind of where she first starts to buddy up with Cersei? Like offering some like legit information? Is it not when she testifies in court against Tyrion? Well, right, but that's I mean that's off that's like just very self serving, like, hey, I'll say what mm. you want to say, sort of thing. But I mean this where she's like legitimately I guess you know, I don't know if she's breaking someone else's trust or she's just been keeping her eye out, you know. Um this is actually something useful. So I mean what's her uh uh being a rote, like what's her what's her end game? What, what do you think she's I mean, she's trying to ride the Cersei train, uh, she thinks Cersei's gonna bring her well, I don't know, more influence, wealth, something. I kind of think of Lady Merriweather like a, the kind of character that you would see in like one of these like prestige drama TV shows like House of Cards or like Billions or something like that. Just like a side character that exists in the periphery that just is ambitious and wants to, you know, obviously secure a position for herself and for her, her husband mm. and just and just, you know, play her own little game. I don't really see it as being anything more significant than that. She's just, you know, an ambitious right. person who's looking to advance in this in this this Game of Thrones. I guess my question is more of, you know, why she decides to hitch her wagon to Cersei when I think most people would realize that Cersei's maybe not the best bet. Um, I guess that happens I mean, a lot I, more I as the book rolls out. But. I think there's plenty of reasons to, you know, bet on Cersei. She is, you know, effectively the one in power at this point. Um, and <laughs> She uh she has you know she she's a Lannister she controls the king of Westeros that's there's plenty of good reasons why yeah think that and it's not Cersei like it's it. not like Lady Mary- Merryweather's waiting for a better opportunity I mean she's probably just going to take the first opportunity that shows up uh, it's not like she has a lot of access to anyone else hey we can now hear you okay hey well, Patrick hey how you go how you guys doing everybody welcome Patrick to the call hi Patrick hello greetings mortals it is I. Patrick the Tall. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So you've uh, you caught a bit of our discussion here on um, yes. the first chapter. What uh, do you think? Yeah. Of? About uh, Lady Merriweather or what? Or just, just about the general. chapter in general. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't feel that much about it. It's, it's very set up. I think for me, at least, it's. Uh, Nah, yeah. I mean, I like as if you just the way you just commented on Lady Merriweather, though. I I do have a feeling a feelings about her on what her role might be, and as you said, Zach, not really that much. <laughs> uh, I think she's basically uh, uh, <clears throat> the reason why she's ha- hitching her 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 stuff to uh, to Cersei is basically because uh, the way she's doing it, at least, is is um, very un. Uh, threatening to a lot of the men. It's just not like she's uh, grabbing any power, really. She's uh, more like right. just uh, uh, being the the friend of the the crazy crazy woman. Uh, plus, she can get some honors while that is happening. But uh, I don't think that anyone will look at look at uh, Lady Merriweather and and her husband, or whatever, and 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 see and say, well, we have to take their their lands away from afterwards, even if there is a coup, because it's not like they're threatening in any way to well, the Tyrell. Yeah. The, the only anything. potential blowback, I guess, would be maybe from Marjorie if uh, this is connected back to her, you know, down the line or something. But, any 
even then, you're really. right. It's probably not probably not a huge risk. Exactly, there's there's minimal risk and 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 a lot of uh, benefit to get to getting in with the person in power at the, at this moment, I think. Uh, so so in that situation, I I enjoy her her presence in in the chapters in general. I think she's uh, showing another side of of Cersei, uh, or showing the same side but just from a different angle. Uh, because it is she's still very self centered, and everything is about Cersei always. But in this sen- sense, it's not always just it has to be a reflection of ourself, so to say. Right. Uh, and I, I like the contrast in this chapter of the wedding uh, for Tommen to um, Joffrey's wedding, you know, and they said that mm. there was less than 100 people there. He's yeah. nine, Marjorie's 17, and they ended off with basically a fireworks show burning the Tower of the Hand. And um, I mean, there's kind of a bedding, but not really, you know, they like make sure they go to bed. And I don't know, it's that whole thing's weird. But uh, yeah, it is kind of interesting how they're like just very business, let's get it done. Uh, they're more concerned about you know making sure no one poisons the food and uh cersei's still worried that maybe Tyrion's hiding somewhere in the bowels of the tower although i mean if he could be in the tower he could probably be anywhere in the castle at that point i would think plus the shelter yeah but it's dates for the, the for our king's landings for the dates that are involved so that's why they're not spending as much on this wedding compared to the other one yeah i mean it, it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense for a, a number of reasons to, yeah. to have a big wedding again it's more dangerous yeah. it's more costly it's you know i mean you just had one literally um you know a little over a month before this so oh, yeah <laughs> not uh, is, this isn't exactly like the big celebratory moment this is sort of like the consolation wedding that they have to do because joffrey died yeah i guess so so some people will cite uh this moment at the end of the chapter um where jamie kind of makes this direct comparison to Eris, as Cersei burns the tower and she seems to kind of revel in the, the burning of something as evidence potentially of yeah. Cersei being a secret Targaryen, uh, obviously. Yeah. Um, so do, what do you guys think about that? Do you think there's any legitimacy to that kind of that angle? I don't know. Considering how crazy Cersei is, yeah, <laughs> I, I think there's more yeah, chance but, of her being a Targaryen than Tyrion. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. I don't care if any of them are or aren't necessarily. Yeah. Uh, it could it could be, but at the same time, like you don't have to be a Targaryen to be crazy or to be a pyro or to be paranoid, you know. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I think I think though that the way Martin writes his stuff is that he does tend to make internal logics of his in his world. So if if there is a, such a thing as Martin genetics, then yes, craziness will be hereditary and and maybe even just a trait for the Targaryens specifically more so than the others at least so yeah i don't know it could be i don't really care that much as adam said i don't really care that much if she is in, or if uh, jamie is or if uh, Tyrion is is just doesn't really matter that much to me uh, other than, of course, Tyrion needs to be the one who rides the third dragon. So in that sense, it's 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 counterproductive to that sense. But otherwise, yeah, it's kind of non mute for me. It could also just be that psychologically, uh, it's it's been like linked to you know, the feeling of cleansing, purging yourself. And if she's like right. constantly thinking about. Uh, Tyrion and stuff like that. She might want to purge her, her mind of of everything and be, like, help help her move on and not yeah, be exactly. as prepared. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just like just the um, the act of you know spring cleaning or purging or moving or yeah. whatever is really you know, can help people um, improve their mental well being. So you know, burning yeah. down a scary tower. Sure. I do think it's taken to a pretty psychotic extreme here, um, <laughs> but but I agree with you guys, and I think that is kind of proof that like this is this is something that anyone you know. Know, that's kind of on that level of paranoia and just kind of stress and and all these like kind of markers of this level of psychosis you know would do it doesn't necessarily have to link to any kind of like obsession with fire or anything like that she's been feeling cornered maybe not cornered but uh i don't know under siege or attacked for a long while now right ever since uh Renly uh, talked about getting Marjorie in for Robert and whatever she's been thinking about, or even as as a young child when she thought that she would be thrown away from a uh, younger, more beautiful queen. She's always felt like she's she's had to defend herself, her position. So she um, find it's natural that she become uh, paranoid, so to say. Yeah, if you're constantly living with paranoia or 
feeling exposed, then that becomes the new normalcy, right? So to do something extraordinary to get yourself out of that slump would seem crazy for normal people, right? True. Like, no, of course, it's not going to yeah. really, really help ultimately. Uh, paranoia <laughs> is never going to go away no matter how many things. Get no, no, but you, you do it in desperate sea, I think. Yeah, 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 for sure. There is one point in the chapter where I really felt for Cersei uh, when uh, Tommen starts to choke on his... Um, when he takes a sip of wine and he starts to choke and she just peeks out from the And oh, I could like... Yeah. And I, I really felt for her because she's already seen one son die pretty much the same way. And when she flees from the Great Hall to cry because she can't do it because she feels like she can't do it public. That's... Um, yeah, that I think is very natural. That I, I definitely think makes sense. Yeah. But her relationship with Jamie is just falling apart. Well, I mean, she's been, you know, fucking Lancel and Moonboy and everybody else. So, you know, she she hasn't oh, been working yeah. on it. Hasn't been putting a, in the time. That was the wrong order. It was Lancel, the and Osmond, Kettleblack, and, Kettle, and Moonboy. Yeah, Kettleblack and Moonboy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's but it. I just I just wanted to move Moonboy up into like the confirmed territory. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like mushroom. You wanna? Yeah, it's all about mushrooms. Mosellaceous. Uh, <laughs> let's not forget about Moonboy's full name, Moonboy. For all I know. <laughs> for all I know. That's right. Of house, yeah. all I know. Um, yeah. yeah. Wonder what their sigil is. Uh, I think the the most important thing here to me is, as we said, the relationship with Jamie just kind of falling apart, which is the exact opposite of what both of them need right now, considering their current situation. And uh, we'll have, I think, some serious consequences as the books go on, uh, if we ever get another book. Anyway, let's move on to Tyrion 2 from A Dance with Dragons. That is, let's see... The next day, I believe, but it's 39 chapters ahead and do a whole new book. Um, I know this is the same day. And Zach, I believe you have that. Yep. All right. So Tyrion departs Pentos with Illyrio, carried through the Sunrise Gate in the Magister's Litter. As they eat and drink, Tyrion wonders why a man like Illyrio would care who wears the crown in Westeros. Illyrio assures Tyrion that he only wants to, wants to do some good and help Daenerys take back her birthright. He makes it clear that while Viserys was clearly as mad as his father, Daenerys is something else entirely, but she will need help from Tyrion and Griff when she reaches Volantis. Tyrion continues to probe at why Illyrio and the Triarchs of Volantis would assist, uh, quote, the dragon queen who smashed the slave trade, but he continues to dissemble. Tyrion steers the topic toward Varys and wonders at the nature of his relationship with the Magister. Illyrio explains that he and the Spider work together to rise up from poverty in Pentos. As the conversation as the conversations lapse, Tyrion thinks idly about how he used to wander the depths of Casterly Rock, pretending to be some lost Targaryen prince. Tyrion wonders how Illyrio convinced the Golden Company to support a Targaryen, and he explains that the color of the dragon makes no difference, so long as the exiles of the company can return to Westeros. Illyrio and Tyrion talk history, old ambitions, and lost love. Tyrion dreams and drinks and sings of cold, golden hands. He thinks of Shay, and then Tysha, and then Tywin, and, and the thrum of a crossbow, and then he sleeps. So I know you guys don't care about it, but uh, there is some more uh, Tyrion is a Targaryen ammunition uh, in this chapter. Definitely with this this whole thing about him uh, thinking himself to be uh, to be a Targaryen prince and Casterly, Casterly Rock, and uh, obviously that kind of ongoing obsession with dragons. Uh, do we want to talk at all about that, or is it just is it just more? Possible I want Tyrion fodder? to get his dragon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he might. So this, I think I think the main problem is we don't want to listen to logic. So, but 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 we are main, main, I think I'm personally at least mainly on Tyrion's team either way. So that's in that situation. I mean, if you had logical arguments for Cersei, then I wouldn't want to listen to that. But other, but Tyrion, yes, cool, go on. Yeah, I think I think for me it just fits together more in my head, you know, the, just the timeline of it, you know, the whole the whole constant, like, you know, power struggle between uh, Tywin and Eris and and Joanna and all that stuff. It just all makes sense to me. And I know there's some interesting stuff about just the simple fact that you know Tyrion, you know, as uh, as is explained later by Jenna, you know, Tyrion is Tywin's son. You know, he definitely inhabits. And there's this whole kind of interesting like nature versus nurture thing with that. But I don't know. It just it just makes sense to me that he's that he's uh a Targaryen uh, that that something yeah. happened and that that's part of why he's been spurned for so long. You know, I just I don't so know. I, I think the the main thing with the whole Tyrion is a Targaryen thing is that I believe 
a lot of there's a lot of factors that kind of it makes sense it adds up the, the fact that he was born a dwarf and some aspects of him but unlike john where we're like sitting around waiting for people to show up and tell us who john is right and we just assume well there's a character that's going to come along that's like hey i was there i know what happened um even if like let's say Tyrion tames a dragon and is writing it like the best you could get, you could, the best you could hope for is some sort of reveal in the book is like well maybe possibly I have Targaryen blood somewhere and maybe he sort of puts it together but there would never be anything definitive it's it's just not possible so that's, that's why fair. to me it doesn't really matter yeah I think I've, in the unless, story it can't really be revealed right that's true I think for me it's less it's less the uh, kind of payoff of that moment where we say that Tyrion yes he's a Targaryen it's more kind of the thematic uh, you know ways that that kind of plays out just uh, mm. the fact that he is you know he is this person who's so hated. But in, in much the same way, and, you know, he's kind of marked as an outcast uh, and much the same way as John. But he's actually very much, you know, the prince. You know, he is the you know, he is the central. He is at he is back at the center, even though he's been made kind of to stand at the outskirts uh, his whole life. Yeah, for sure. So are, we kind of get a couple interesting dreams uh, from Tyrion in this chapter as he continually drinks himself into a into a drunken stupor. Uh, there's a, there's an early one where he he dreams that uh, he's kneeling before Daenerys and uh, she mistakes him for Jaime and feeds him to her dragons. Do you think there's anything there? Or is it just a just a, a, a drunk dream? Yeah. I mean, that's just, yeah, uh, yeah, um, that's maybe just that his Jamie, mind. Jaime Jaime's going to get eaten by a dragon. Yeah, um, maybe. I hope uh, not. Maybe it's just psychological <laughs> fear. Like you're, he's afraid of getting mistaken, and that yeah, I think I think yeah, I, th- I don't know. I think it's just just subconscious, really. Not yeah, I think so too. A li- not a literal thing. I think so too. But we we have yeah. to uh, we have to see if there's any foreshadowing or theories or anything. Right. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta yeah. check. We gotta check. Yeah, um, I mean, because here's the thing: these books are so big and they're so filled with foreshadowing, and he plants seeds wonderfully, and then every now and then he just kind of fucks things up, and then we like make whole theories about people being pregnant because of it. I guess you know, so it, it happens. <laughs> but uh, I do think that like like Bina wrote in her notes, like this is <laughs> this is the first chapter where i was like yeah you know martin's laying it on really thick that uh Tyrion is a targaryen so i mean i mean sometimes you feel like when it, when it feels like it's a bit too much is it is it really um i don't know it's a little too obvious but um i think one of the more interesting aspects here is how illyrio says that he didn't really expect danny to live very long with the dothraki uh yeah but then again i don't think that george ever gives peop- uh, people what they hope for so in that situation if uh, when right if Tyrion hopes to be a uh, Targaryen, then he will not get that, <laughs> so to say. If if the, we want to follow the the logic of of George's writing, yeah. Well, but, well, by at this point, it's been going on so long, right? Wouldn't it be uh, a surprise if he did? <laughs> like, wouldn't that be the <laughs> wouldn't that be the okay. twist now? <laughs> or being a Targaryen just makes things worse for Tyrion. Maybe you know, it's, it's just right. this kind of perverted uh, dream that, that that goes bad as soon as it's realized. There's that too. So, uh, well, maybe he couldn't get cast in the rock as he wanted uh, because he his father isn't a Lannister. Yeah, there you go. No cast. Then, no cast any rock, and that's all, one of always been one of his dreams, at least. Maybe he burns it down. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So, what about the anything on the that other dream, the one where he's like fighting with bitter steel and Barristan by his side? He has like two heads, like Malus, um, and he kills Jamie and Tyrion. I or uh, and Tywin. Uh, I think it's it's another one. It's just like weird fever dream kind of things. I don't think there's much to it, but it's interesting. Well. Well, yeah, but it's interesting because um, after he kills um, Jamie, he one head is crying, mm-hmm. and I feel like he's still torn about whether he about how much he loves Jamie and how much he's hated by him. Yeah, some kind of duality, kind of conflict yeah. Yeah. within the self, as is, is, is uh, George likes to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I think he's of two minds, based, <laughs> not literally, but but not 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 completely literally, metaphorically, uh, literally, in dream. literally in the dream, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so a different kind of you know theory that we can uh, we can interrogate is this uh, all this stuff about blackfires um, you know whether or not Sarah is the you know progenitor of a uh, of young Griff that we'll soon learn to be either a Targaryen or a blackfire we're not sure um, and you know kind of this this in, this thing that that uh, Tyrion in this chapter is constantly trying to figure out is why would Illyrio and Varys want to support Daenerys what's what's their game what's their plan yeah thoughts on that 
that that's that's I think like I said I think that's one of the more interesting tidbits of this chapter and it's confusing because um, the argument can be made that especially once we get into dance and we realize what's going on and we think okay you know uh, we've got black fires here connected to Illyrio um, I get, uh, Bina has a theory here that Illyrio is a black fire um, I haven't read that so I'll have to look at it here in a second but uh, mm. I think that I, I mean I don't know per- personally the weirdest thing is that he gives her the dragon eggs. So, I mean, he even says right here he didn't expect her to live very long. Um, he throws a bit of support behind her in what is, you know, we we find out later is maybe just deployed by time or something. But here she's hatched dragons, and very clearly now she's become part of his plan, even if she wasn't entirely before. Mm. And, you know, he, he wants to meet up with the Golden Company and, you know, get things going. But I don't think, I don't know if Danny is still his endgame, um, if she ever really was in the first place, you know? But I think it's it, it, like, why give her the why yeah, give her the dragon like... eggs? And like, did he expect anything from the Dothraki? Like, I don't think he expected that they would ever cross the sea, right? So, was like, what was the I don't know what was the purpose of marrying her off like that? You know, um, I don't. I think he just gave her the dragon egg as a gift as a very expensive gift but i don't think he expected anything to come of that because a lot of people have tried to hatch dragon eggs over the years and nothing has worked so far so nobody can predict oh, that right. year old or a 14 year old is going to manage somehow to hatch those dragons right so also, he just gave a very expensive certainly gift he, he, he didn't out. expect he didn't expect her to come out with live dragons but he gave you know he could have given her one egg and kept the other two for Aegon. um i mean because the, the dragon yeah. eggs are basically just a symbol of the fact that she's a, tag- a targaryen that like that's the whole idea so why give her the only three dragon eggs he had when they're so rare i you know uh i mean it makes a good wedding gift and maybe he just was like fuck it i don't care at this point it just seems aren't there like a aren't there like a lot of dragon eggs in ashai so well yeah you can just import them from there sorry i feel like i've read that i don't think there's like thousands of them or anything um, well, no. I mean, it doesn't but... say how many exist in the world, but they're fairly they're fairly rare, and these are the only three he had, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's I think and it was said something like, like I think it was said something like it was uh, it was very uncommon outside of 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 uh, Ashai. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I think it's quite. I mean, let's go by logic. If he's associated and they're they've thrown a lot in together, uh, varies and 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 Illyrio. Uh, Varys is very much against magic, so to say, right? Uh, that's the first thing. So if he's against magic and he he's uh, and they they have complete disclosure of, on how things are going, then then Illyria wasn't counting on on magic getting b- back in the world right. at any point. Um, Do you think Varys would be okay with magic if he could use it for his own purposes, or is he just I, flat out no magic? I don't know. I <clears throat> I yeah. don't well. Various is still difficult to read completely, you know. Uh, I mean, one second he's like buddying up with everybody, everybody and then the second uh, he's like shooting him in the back. So uh, I don't know that I, that I cannot talk about. But uh, and the whole well, the whole thing is that dragons might be the exception for him. He's very against magic, and maybe you could say that you know with the dragons, maybe his end game would be to eliminate the dragons as well. I don't know, mm. but the whole idea that he might be a secret targ or a secret um, blackfire, then maybe dragons would be the one thing that he's like, yeah, these are you know this is cool, just good to have. So this is my notion though. Uh, what if that really they don't really don't care either of them? Uh, also with the Targaryen thing. I mean, from uh, from a mainland Essos point of view, why are Targaryens that much more special than any of the other uh, Targaryen or, or the uh, Valyrian lines that uh, diluted? Still yeah, that's the only thing, right? I mean, they lucked out, yeah. so to say. So in in that sense. Uh, you should imagine that even if they he's not a none, none of them are secret blackfires or whatever they just have valyrian blood in them they should think that they're equally you know suited to become rulers of of uh, westeros i mean and and then the whole notion that daenerys has suddenly become into power and and you know uh, earned some or won some uh, legitimate legit, legitimacy uh, by getting dragons, hatching dragons. That would be then it would be natural to hit your uh, your usurper, so to say, to that person that has actual legitimacy, uh, rather than just saying, "Well, let's <laughs> you know go both over and see who wins." Right. Right. Uh, right. 
I think yeah, it's just. I, I mean, it doesn't I, seem. It doesn't seem his end goal is to gain lands or power or anything either. Okay, so the theory I like is that Illyrio somehow ended up with a child who has silver hair, and he and Varys figured out that this is a great opportunity for us because this baby is the same age as Rhaegar's son would have been. So they decide to put him on the throne, right? Illyrio also somehow manages to get his hands on Danny, but they have this other child that they're going to put up as, you know as the heir. So they decide, okay, it's fine. Viserys wants to marry her off to this random called Drogo, so let him do it. But then she goes off and manages to hatch these dragons and they figure out, okay, this is another opportunity. We should have them have these two Targaryens meet up and conquer Westeros together. So So, so you think that I don't it's know, the theory it's of like they're just diversifying? Yeah. Ex- yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that's why he gave her the dragon egg, so he still have her like in his back pocket, you know, if he needs. They it. don't really, they Some don't really favor with, either with one. Is, is what you're thinking? Yeah. I think I think Ilario definitely favors Aegon because. It's probably, he's probably somehow related to him. Might be his son, for all we know. Because well, no, he's, for all we know, he's he'd be Moonboy's like... son then, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is that he gave Danny these fossilized dragon egg, right? Very expensive, but fossilized. Yeah. So nothing we can attempt. Whereas the one Targaryen heirloom that is, you know, going around Essos is Blackfire, right? The sword Blackfire. And that yeah, is for Yeah, unique. Which I'm... That's true. Yeah. So that I mean, he wasn't giving that to Viserys on any on any level. No, by no yeah, means. Yeah, exactly. Nobody was giving anything to Viserys. <laughs> he was he just. Was yeah, I mean, they they wanted they wanted the Dothraki to kill Viserys off, basically, and that he was a problem. Yeah. And I guess it makes. I, I guess it does make sense because if I mean, best case scenario for him is probably Danny goes, uh, marries Carl Drogo, and brings back you know the dothraki and they actually decide to go across the sea and now he's given her these eggs and you know he's in you know he's in with her and everything worst case he just loses some money which he has a ton of but if you go by that logic you mean why yeah. do you need to kill viserys i just thinking he just doesn't like Viser- viserys is a pain in the butt i think maybe but 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 in like line of succession viserys would still be second right of, to uh, aegon yeah Aeg- to aegon, yeah to aegon. yeah because uh, his father was a crown prince. Right, because Rhaegar was already, the, yeah. I think so. I think that's but, how it works. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but again, line of secession and as messy as everything is, you know, that's kind of, they they fudge that a bit. But, you, you know, but you have I mean, to take into account also the, the Dorn, right? Dorn is, they had like marriage agreements and stuff like that. Uh yeah, so, from a long time ago. I mean. Yes, but yeah. the only but the only people who know about that marriage agreement are the Dornish. I mean, nobody else knows about it. Do you so. think I, I'm I'm just throwing this like crazy theory out? Do you think that it's possible that? Do you think it's possible that Illyrio intentionally, you know, kind of got Daenerys out of the way and married uh, her to Khal Drogo to kind of destroy that alliance, to kind of like put a stop on that, so that he could later turn around and and make her, you know, the obvious like match for Aegon later, so to kind of like get Quentin and and uh, and um, Arianne kind of out of the way, <laughs> just like not even can like let that that. that play well, out. but like then she would. I mean, in his mind, you know, Khal Drogo wouldn't be dead. Um, that would be a hill to climb there, right? Yeah, no, I, it's it's uh, there's a, there's so much in. This whole thing, there are so many possible avenues. It's actually it's really hard to like rely <laughs> so, you know, on. Any so you know, given I, one. I, I like I, I like Nadia's idea that he's just like, well, I'm gonna put a little money here in stocks and a little money in right. bonds. Yeah, he's and diversifying. I'm just gonna... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a yeah, great yeah. We'll just, just whatever. Throwing works. a lot of balls in the air and seeing what sticks. You know, seeing what uh, seeing what. Yeah, sticks. if you you know yeah. if you've got if you're a guy that has a ton of money and you invest a bunch in a lot of startups, eventually one of them is Facebook or something, right? Is that how it works, right? Um, and then, and then but at the same time, I feel like he does. <laughs> I feel, I feel like he does favor Aegon, so he was kind of like trying to get Danny out of the way until she hatched the dragon, which, you know. That, that's a different yeah, but he, but he does a, give her, he does the give her a legitimate chance. The, yeah, the dragons change everything, but he gives her a legitimate chance the way he sets her up. Um, he's he's not actively working against her, I don't think. He's just not having her hang around his house or whatever, but, but like she's got a shot yeah. with what he does. But also, try try imagining if they succeeded. Uh, try imagining if... if uh, Viserys actually, you know, managed to muster the Khal Drogo's army and whatever. They get over to Westeros and start plundering and whatever, making a, a disaster out of everything. Who better to come and save stuff? Even if that happened, even if everything succeeded for Viserys and and uh, Daenerys, 
they would still be so alien that uh, <laughs> that anyone right. who could say could well, save them from that fate. At, yeah, at that point, you could swoop in with the Golden Company and say, "Hey, this is a Blackfire. Remember the Targaryens kind of treated you bad. Why don't you give him a try?" Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, these even do that. and these are crazy. And these are crazy. So, so I'm curious, uh, Nadia, in your in your theory, where uh, where Aegon is Illyrio's son, do you think he's still a Blackfire in that case, or that he's just he's not anybody? No, just a kid who somehow managed to end up with silver hair. Right. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's. Plausible. He doesn't have to be. Go ahead. Yeah, his mother was um, Lysini, right? And mm-hmm. the Lysini are also descended from Valerians. So it's like you know, to a certain extent. might as well, you know. No, that aren't they uh, pretty pretty mixed in 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 lice? I think I think they're pretty well, mixed, yes. but 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 they do yeah, keep uh, but... they keep they keep a uh, like pure Valerian lines for a. Uh, you know, whoring purposes, I think, <laughs> basically. Right? Wasn't it like that? Isn't it like yeah, that? There's like like that. A... Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's entirely plausible. And it's, again, this idea that, like, I think there's all kinds of options of theories that could make sense. The only one I don't think it is, is I don't think Aegon is actually Rhaegar's son. That's the only one that I don't think, <laughs> I don't think is true. It's just, it's too obvious and it just doesn't, it just doesn't, it wouldn't be interesting. Oh, yeah. I think just kind of in support of the Blackfire idea, I do think there are two significant lines uh, in this chapter that kind of hint at that. First one just being this idea that a points out about how some contracts are are made in ink some in blood obviously the golden company one is made in blood here and that seems to signify obviously their their kind of original intention to, to support the blackfires to support uh damon blackfire bitter steel all that stuff uh second line you know just kind of Tyrion uh being dubious about why the golden company would support uh targaryen and just this uh, this like total bullshit line by illyria that i just don't believe at all that that you know red dragon black dragon same thing that they don't care they care they care about who they support and they would only support a black fire that's the that's the only the only thing that i think is kind of the two key points that are kind of in support of the the whole black fire madness Mm, yeah i mean it's a good point and maybe you know it's also possible that maybe they just think that aegon's a black fire whereas that's just delirio and various pulling the strings like you know john collington has no idea what's actually what's actually going on that's that could be possible too like there's there's all kinds of it's hard to it's hard to prove anything yeah they just um Mm. You know, yeah, they tell even, Griff yeah. that he's Rhaegar's son. They tell Griff that he's Rhaegar's son, so he believes it. They tell the Golden Company he's a Blackfire, so they believe that. And then, you know, it doesn't matter because he's he looks the part. And it just so turns out he just happens. uses some hair dye, you know? I mean, that's a lot of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is like, yeah, there's no there's like no way to prove anything. You just have a few people that you think are trustworthy and they say something, right? Um yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Until we actually get in their head and kind of get some hard facts, we can't we can't be sure about anything. No, but mm. I mean to the people, like you know, it, it, it's when like a, a royal shows up, like even in, in our you know society, you're talking you know a couple hundred years ago, someone shows up and says, "Well, I'm actually, you know, this long lost princess or something." Like, well, mm. it's a it's a bitch to disprove it, and you can say, "Well, it's hard for me to prove it because of all these things." There's there's no social security numbers, and there's you know like there's just no there's nothing to track it like we have now. Right? No DNA testing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. nothing like you just you just say, "Well, look the hair," or look. I mean, even yeah. the crazy part is with uh you know stannis tracked down all of robert's bastards and he's like oh my gosh they all have black hair so that it's impossible that he could have a kid that doesn't have black hair you know he Mm. you know read through the book which i mean i don't know if that's necessarily impossible but his you know it's a pretty good hypothesis and he's right so you know but does it really prove it no well to be fair it was black hair and blue eyes so. Right, yeah. Yeah. So two markers. And it was generations and generations of the same stuff, which yeah. is pretty odd in and of itself. But so, um, well, you can always go back to the whole. Uh, you know, you can't prove that I'm not a secret Targaryen, right? Uh, right. The double. Right. The double <laughs> negative uh, confirmation. That's uh, that's always my favorite in those situations. And that's why everybody is. Everybody's a secret Targaryen. Yeah, exactly. Can't prove that uh, Pot Boy is Pot, Pot Pie isn't a secret Targaryen. All right. So Bina asks an interesting question here. Um, are there any theories as to why the old Targs didn't leave Dragonstone? They knew. They knew what was going to happen. They kept their summer home, Wait. and then you know, I don't know. They they well they did know. They left ahead of uh they left ahead of the Doom and all that, but. Um, and then when they got there, they didn't. It took them a while before they actually ventured into Westeros, right? Yeah. And I think. I think. I don't know how long was Dragonstone there before. I don't know if they ever really even went into Westeros. 
uh, before the doom. Uh, yeah, that was that was what I was going to ask. There's a point um, in the chapter where I think Tyrion points out that uh, where he was wondering why the Valerians had stopped at Dragonstone. You know, since they'd gotten so close to Westeros, right. why hadn't they gotten uh, when they were and at they the height dragons. of their powers? Why hadn't exactly? Why didn't they conquer Westeros too? Why did they stop at Dragonstone? Why did it take them yeah, like they, they could have easily years just decided this day. is our new kingdom at any time? Yeah, but exactly. didn't it? But they wasn't didn't. it set? Wasn't it? Wasn't it set in like the the world of ice and fire that uh, at least said uh, that they felt like the the seven kingdoms was quite uh, you know uh, a pr- a bridge too uh, far sort of thing a pr- primitive or something like that yeah they were a bit different oh. very different at least well, but I mean it's also not like Dragonstone is a paradise I don't know. I guess. Yeah, but when a when a place is like a primitive and you know in your perspective it's primitive and the people are fighting with each other and everything that's like the prime candidate for um you know conquering right yeah. I, but so, I kind of feel like since Dragonstone is kind of cold and bleak that like maybe if it's like they had taken uh, one of the Summer Isles and just stayed there you'd be like oh yeah, yeah that was they were content for sure but Dragonstone was just sort of like a place they went to to kind of get away from things and I guess when you have dragons you don't have to stay there very long but it like, was yeah. but dragons Dragon. before Aaron Targaryen, Targaryen went to Dragonstone it was already a, an outpost for the Valyrian Empire so I'm wondering why is this remote island the place that they chose to have as their outpost like got, is there got, something yeah. special about Dragonstone yeah there is um, it's okay, quite it is. quite it's and quite we know obvious that the dragons really seem the to dragons like too. it like yeah, the yeah, dragons I mean, seem to enjoy the place. So is that yeah, it's because it's a volcanic island. It's uh, one of the only volcanoes in in west in near Westeros, right? Except for up north. So, or yeah, yeah. So it's kind, of, it's kind of similar to what they were used to in Valyria. But also, if you want to breed dragons, <laughs> I mean, yeah. if you want to get more dragons and cons- consolidate your power, I think you might want to you know stay the place where they they flourish. I think. Or all I the know, dragon I, glasses if you want to fight the others. You know. at, yeah, if, if that's also... <laughs> we don't know if that's part of uh, Danis's uh, premonition. Mayhaps. She saw that as well. We don't know. Mayhaps. Can't say that they, she didn't dream that. Throwback. Hashtag okay. throwback. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, okay, let's see. What else do we have here? Um, let's see. Drunk... Tyrion thinking of Shay and Taisha. It's more sadness. Yeah. Uh, any, there's going to be a lot of that. There's going to be a yeah, lot of that. Yeah, there's going to be a so lot can, of that. We can save that for later. But... Wherever Tyrion goes. Um, okay. You guys want to move on to our next chapter? Sounds good. All right. So let's see. We do head now to February 14th, and it's fifty or 46 chapters back to Sansa 1 from A Feast for Crows. And let's see. Sansa is 14. Littlefinger is 32. Still, you know, just let you know, very creepy. Uh, Marillion is 20, you know, so there's that. And let's see. Is that Nadia? You have that for us? Yep. Okay, so Marillion, who is now imprisoned in the sky cells, keeps everyone in the area awake by singing mournful songs constantly. Sansa begged Littlefinger to make him stop, but he just says that he made Marillion a promise. He tells her that um, soon it will be over because Lord Nestor Royce is making his way to the area. Sansa is terrified that Marillion will tell Lord Royce the truth, but Peter is certain that even if he does, the lords will still believe Sansa and Peter Baelish because, because it will be their words against his. Sansa knows she will have to testify against Marillion. She doesn't want to tell any more lies, but she knows there's no, no one left but Peter to protect her. So she'll do what he asks. Lord Nestor and his party reach the area the next afternoon. Sansa is told to bring Lord Robert to the High Hall to greet his guest. She cleans him up and escorts him to the High Hall, even after he tells her that he didn't sleep well because his door was locked. Um, from the outside. Lord Nestor asks Robert what happened to Lady Lysa and he tells them that Marillion killed her and that Sansa and Peter have seen it all. Sansa tells her story of how Marillion had pushed Lysa out of the moon door. Lord Robert wants Marillion to be thrown out of the moon door and then he starts to have uh, then, then he starts to shake violently. No one seems shocked by this episode since they all seem very used to it. After the shaking stops, Lord Robert is taken back to his bed. Lord Nestor seems to take Sansa's word for how Lysa died. Peter tells them he blames himself for Lysa's death since he asked her to send Marillion away. Nestor Royce wants to question Marillion himself. Marillion tells them how jealous he was of Lysa being married to someone other than himself and that when she told him she was pregnant with Peter's child. She, he lost his mind and he pushed her out the moon door. 
he is returned to the sky cells and lord nestor joins peter in the solar they talk about how bronze yon mistrust peter and is now bringing the other lords of the vale to the airy peter gives lord nestor a decree which gives him which gives his line of the family the title of keeper of the gates of the moon in perpetuity lord nestor notices that it not it wasn't signed by lysa but by peter the lord flecker and peter tells him that lysa died before she could sign it Lord Nestor takes his leave and Sansa asks Peter why he hadn't had uh, Robert sign the decree but she quickly realizes that it means that if Peter is killed or is removed Lord Nestor's legitimacy as keeper of the gates of the moon will be called into question Sansa reminds Peter that she is not Elaine but Peter insists that she must never mention it not even in private she goes to bed where she is soon joined by Robert Robert asks her if she is now his mother and she replies with I suppose I am Ugh. Very creepy. Poor kid. Yeah. I mean, poor kids, both of them. <laughs> he's still the master plotter here in the books, so. Yeah, he's just playing everyone. Yeah, and he knows, like, little tricks, like, just, like, whose signature is on a document can can be a big deal, you know, at least for, you know, keeping people from throwing him out of power, which he doesn't really deserve. Like, his his rise, like, through, you know, these, you know, three, you know, three and a half books now is pretty, is pretty crazy, and the fact that he didn't like do it by overthrowing anyone, I think, is like the craziest part. I kind of kind of think that um, he's assuming a bit. I mean, as as I think many of us was uh, you know surprised to, to learn that, or at least we didn't think about that notion about the signature on on the on that uh, paper. I think he might also be. What if Nestor doesn't didn't pick up on that? If he's like, like, uh, well, Herp and Derp, then he could uh, bring it up just, later, right? Maybe, yeah. But if he, but what if uh, Nestor just does the things behind his back and like overthrows him before he can, you know, make his point, so to say? Uh, maybe I think maybe if he felt that the message wasn't getting across, he would have he would have made it, you know, fair, clear enough, you know. He would have, yeah, he would have, may, yeah, maybe. But I'm thinking that if you assume that people are more clever than they are you might sometimes you know get burned on be disappointed yeah this is true. <laughs> uh, this so is true. i'm thinking yeah i just a, just a thought that if you if if we as readers don't pick up on that before it's like spelled out to us uh what's to say that any person in westeros would would pick up on it more or less, unless they're really that, trained that to that seems, shit. That, yeah, that seems like a procedural thing that they they would be very attuned to. You know, yeah. uh, like when Maybe. you get a, it's like especially with everything that's been going on with the War of the Five Kings, right? If if you get, you know, if Ned Stark signed a decree that gave you something, right? It it's meaningless now, you know. Versus if it was Robert at the time, you'd go, well, he was the king, and you know, yeah, it, um, yeah. So all, so all lords has have a lord, uh, a law degree. Uh, yeah, they've got they've got a little pocketbook, a little a little uh, quick reference guide. Yeah. Tells, tells them is this is this an acceptable document? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they have the maesters that should be able to pretty quickly, mm. you know, discern that sort of thing. But and we all know the maesters are neutral. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Except if you're magic, then you're, they're not. To me, it kind of feels like something that's there. There, there's, there just aren't like hard and fast rules on. It's kind of just what people are feeling like deciding is legitimate at the time you know Cersei decided in that moment that that uh she could just rip that paper in half from Robert like other people might have felt differently it's just whatever people feel like at the time makes sense and it's just kind of assumed that since Littlefinger is kind of this upstart lord like he his word does not carry much that is well that's just it is he needs you need he needs to be you know getting people in positions that are you know indebted to him to support him in his position I mean, that absolutely makes sense. And it's the same thing like with Cersei, the whole thing, um, you know, ro- the decree that Robert wrote. How many people had seen that before? She's like, yep, yeah, we're not doing this. You know, it wasn't. Yeah, Ned should have printed some copies of Xerox. Yeah. He should have sure. <laughs> just well, taken it around the castle as insurance. He just instead he was like, I've got this paper that protects me. And they were like, you're an idiot. Also, uh, I like to point out that in law, that's also kind of how it sometimes happens. That you know, it ba- it's a lot is based on precedents, mm-hmm, right? And and that's usually how we do it until another president has been made. Like in this situation, like in Cersei's situation, like well, we should listen to what the dying wish of the king was, uh, and then she changes that, and then well, maybe not. I guess. <laughs> well, now, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It never makes sense at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think I think that's that's also how it is in, in you know real law nowadays basically. 
So yeah. At least in Denmark, I have to tell you, say. No, it's, that's true. I think that's pretty much true. In most yeah. Well, this is com- this is completely off topic, but there was a recent dollop about um, a bunch of land, like in like the 1800s or whatever, out in it was like Arizona or New Mexico or something. And the guy and the guy made up all these papers saying that like you know it was this like Spanish land grant that never existed to people who never existed, and he now owned it, and and it was just like prove me wrong for like decades. Uh, Call yeah. back. Call back. Yeah. Can't prove me wrong. It's that's true. right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, I, I always like to kind of make it. It's interesting with the linear reread, because obviously this is not the uh, intended order that George had when he wrote the books. But you, you can still kind of make these connections between the chapters, uh, you know, that we kind of line up for these episodes. And for me, the key one is like this just kind of pall of like paranoia and just kind of disorientation and madness uh, that, that kind of runs through these chapters. Obviously, in uh, Cersei and, and uh, Tyrion, Tyrion's case, it's a little more, you know, severe. Obviously, there's drinking going on, and there's just this kind of, you know, obvious uh, paranoia and madness that, that that they both exhibit. In this case, it's not as as extreme, but I do kind of really feel strongly the disorientation in this chapter uh, from Sansa. Kind of obviously, Marillion singing, it just becomes this kind of constant point of stress, this constant thing that's just bearing down on her. That's that's you know the, causing her not to sleep well. It's you know it's depressing depriving her of that and she's just uh experiencing that and it kind of it kind of leads into later on this arc in uh in this book for Sansa this kind of um this kind of dissociation of herself that that happens as she kind of takes on a kind of completely different personality uh it's it's a uh, it's it's got the same kind of vibe to me yeah i agree it's uh though i think was it isn't it like can you say that like Feast for Crows in general is like very yeah, harrowed in general? It, it's it's definitely a theme that runs through the whole book. That this is the the sad aftermath of all the blood that was spilled in in Storm of Swords. It even it even kind of infects the the structure of the book itself, the way that the chapters are named. Uh, this yeah. kind of this kind of way that you know identities are kind of confused mm. and and just everything is a little less clear and, and certain. Mm. Because all of the uh, well, I don't know if 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 uh, Ned's death was the first, you know, um, signal that convention was thrown out of the the, the window, out of the tower. Then uh, then you know, Rob's death was at least the the beacon that now shows that we are on a different path than what you thought we would be on. At least, I think. So oh, so definitely. so so in that loss of innocence, so to say, in the books, and as a reader, I think it makes sense to make a like a a, a post battle battlefield sort of book. In a way, I agree. Which... Yeah, I think uh, it's something that obviously affects the characters, and it affects us as readers too. And you know, there's a lot of reasons why we complain about a piece for crows and a dance with dragons, but it's it's still interesting. I think there's still there's still a lot of, of cool themes to uh, to pull out uh, of these two books. So happy that we're doing that. Yeah, and I mean, I I never was like as much of a, a hater on these books as some people, and the the more, especially when we started doing feast dance, I think that really helped. So maybe I should go back and read them in order again, and maybe I'll, that'll make me salty. And I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, you can do that if you want to be salty, but I mean, you can <laughs> just live in, in the blitz that you now feel like you have a more of a of a chronological feeling of the story. Yeah. Well, one thing I, I I felt would be good is like to read all of the Ironborn chapters just like in order. Oh. Um, as their own thing, just to kind of see what perspective that gives you. That'd make you real that. salty, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, I yeah. can support that. <laughs> well, it's funny, though, right? Yeah. Because at least for me, you know, something that I could not possibly have anticipated is that two Ironborn characters are actually my favorite characters uh, at this point in the series, like at the end of Dance, which are Theon and, and Asha. Those are two of my, like, top characters. So okay. that's something. Yeah, not Victorian, sorry. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you just, Patrick was over there, you had his hopes up, and yeah, you just crushed yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It was, you, you should see me. I was like, smile from one end to the other, whatever, and, and then you just dash my hopes. You're yeah, about yeah, to say I, I, still like, I, King. I, I, I think the Ironborn in general are interesting. It's like the only World of Ice and Fire podcast I actually follow through on. So there's there's that. Um, but but uh, yeah, it's 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 cool to kind of see it. with a series that's so long and that's been going so long, kind of where your kind of focus shifts and you know who you identify with and who you focus on. One one thing that i was wondering there is um you know with the linear reread the the structure of it is also factoring in the winds of winter sample chapters 
Um, mm. I don't think we've actually because there's I don't know if there's a way to actually place them in the timeline. Mm. So they aren't. I know they're not in the actual timeline. Although I, some people have, I think, tried to place them. Um, yeah, I don't know if any of them take place during dance proper. I'd have to look at it, but it's hard because they can be changed. Yep. Like they're not official yet. Uh, yeah, should be a, like a mini reread just to you know every yeah, time. Yeah, because the... I feel like the I feel like the prologue um, probably happens a bit after some of the events that we get in the winds chapters, right? Yeah, with uh, everything that uh, various or that um, Kevin Lannister is talking about with uh, the Golden Company and Aegon and all that. So. Mm. Yeah. I was also wondering, um, is there any other like line storylines that you would want to read out of the book, like the books in general, like other well, than I think the obviously read. Danny kind of, I mean, they, they did that for the first book. Right. But I think if you read her chapters back to back, um, yeah. I, I, I did that for the first uh, few books. I did that and it helps kind of pull them all together. And that's mostly because they're so spread out through the books. I mean, everyone else, almost everyone else will get multiple point of view chapters in the location. So maybe we see what Bran seeing, you know, or what Ned seeing, then what Arya seeing. And, you know, you're, you're getting the same location yeah. and, and it's coming up a few chapters later with Danny. It could be, oh, it's been 20 chapters and what's going on over there. So mm. I think, you know, sometimes you forget stuff or, you know, you're just like, oh, yeah, that's right. There's a whole this whole other story going on. So I think Danny um, probably makes sense. The all is the, yeah. the wall is kind of isolated, but is a bit different. I think so all I the major really characters are, are worthy. Like all the major characters are worthy of a character read where you just read their yeah. chapters in isolation and kind of look at it from that perspective. Just to um, follow their journey. If that's what you're, you're interested is and kind of really really uh interrogating that particular character yeah. and, and their journey as you said yeah exactly but i was well was we kind of did that which character would you not want to just like read all of their chapters back to brand <laughs> brand um, <laughs> very depressing brian oh wait oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> no i think for me Bran. that was actually the, what i was inter- the Greek stuff Bran. Yeah, I think uh, I was allude, kind of trying to allude to that. that if somebody had mentioned Bran, I would have asked why they wanted to specifically read that. Uh, I, I mean, would. he's you would. Yeah, I I, I like Bran. Okay, so uh, what what's your reasoning behind other than you just you like Bran? I think I mean I, it's 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 a hard thing to uh to kind of quantify, but you know I I do like I, I do think some of his situations aren't as interesting as the other characters, but I do like watching kind of him as this young character having to deal with this traumatic reversal of fortunes, kind of having to to deal with that and learn how he's gonna learn his path forward um from that you know who he's gonna be now that his it's a it's kind of a thing that you know a lot of characters deal with kind of learn who he's gonna be uh, now that the the dream he's always had is shattered. It's something that actually comes up in uh, this Tyrion chapter we we talked about how Tyrion had all these different like ambitions and dreams he originally wanted to be a knight also like Bran but he realized very quickly that was not going to happen wanted to be uh, uh, the high, Sempt- high Septon that also didn't pan out I don't know it's interesting to kind of look at how a character learns to uh, adjust to a new life uh, when they uh, they had no kind of way to uh, to, to uh, predict that that would be what their life is going to be like yeah I mean, I, I only the only real thing I have against him is like I feel like a lot of the chapters are designed to be like the action lull. Uh, That's true. That's true. Yeah, uh, they are, it is a bit of an aside when you come to a yes. chapter. These I'm are not the breaks I, frankly like I'm happens. not looking at it to be entertained. Like I'm not. That's <laughs> okay. not that, it would be like a specific. My goal would be to really, uh, really kind of take a deep dive into Bran as a character. That okay, would be so, the only motivation. Yeah. After so, how many times we've read these books to see what what you can pull out new. I mean, that's like why. You yeah. Know, I think the linear format helps because it also gives us a, a new format to read and new perspectives. Yeah. Uh, so so just read so, them again. So Psych 101 case. Yeah. You want to read that? Purely for academic purposes. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> what? You say, if, do you say that you take pleasure in reading stuff? Do you That's feel... ridiculous. We don't do that here. <laughs> no. Books are for, books are for Learning. theories and analysis. I don't know but... about you guys, but I only do the audiobooks. I've never read a word of these. <laughs> <laughs> well... well... <laughs> 
that's obviously a joke. But yeah, in, well, you shouldn't but, have said that. You know, it's like it's like some some things cannot be it's unsaid. A, it's a soundbite now. We're gonna pull yeah. that out. <laughs> to kind yeah. of, I mean, to kind of, uh, I mean, I guess kind of back off on that that point though. Like, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to enjoy things. Uh, you know, it's, mm. yeah, I think there, there's a way to enjoy it where you kind of really do dive into this character and kind of think about that. And there's something gratifying about that um, too. And that there are actually are moments in Brand's story that I find genuinely like enjoyable. So <laughs> there's that too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, like that time he almost ran into John. Great stuff. Yeah. Oh, what a tease. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I don't know. Like, like just to give an example, the uh, you know the stories that he hears about Heron Hall. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. Bran has a lot of the good lore in his chapters. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He's the uh, he's the exposition guy. Yeah, when he's in the Night Fort, and we heard about the Rat King and um, yeah, the stories I... about the wall. And we're going to probably be getting a lot more of that stuff now that he's a tree. So that'll be fun. Yeah. yeah. Maybe he's like, he wants to we've go already back gotten see the, like, himself. We've already gotten like one set of visions, right? That he's had mm-hmm. yep. through the tree. So, yeah. Oh yeah, brand chapters always have a lot of prophecy in them. Yep. From yeah. the very beginning. Yeah, the whole dreaming while he's uh, in bed, all these like weird connections with the mountain and, and all this stuff. It's, uh, it's cool. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess I have always kind of wondered why Bran, you know, um, it, it, there's nothing. I mean, he's a Stark, you know, but there's there's a bunch of them. So, yeah, I think if we're talking kind of mechanistically about like his his importance to the plot, it, it, it is probably to reveal certain truths that we wouldn't otherwise yeah. have access to. Like that's the, the ultimate like importance of his character from like a plot standpoint. I think there's obviously other reasons why he's an interesting character, at, you know, as a character. But his service to the plot is to reveal things we would, couldn't otherwise learn. Yeah, it's like exactly. I mean, George has made a point that he doesn't want omnipresent, uh, you know, narrators, so to say. But this is the closest we will get to that, basically. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> because all the characters are, f- you know, f- flawed and and doesn't have complete insight in what their motivations are and whatever, we usually tend to, you know, get colored by whatever and and not, maybe not maybe get led astray by random, uh, seemingly important uh, tidbits. Uh, so adding person like Bran, uh, what? Uh, you know, help us to to get a lot of in, inform the readers uh, in a way that we wouldn't be able to without like a all powerful omnipresent person. And there may be more to him that we we don't know yet. There could be something else that he ends up doing. Yeah, who's well, to say at this point? Fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's also possible to kind of just keep throwing the uncertainty in here that his uh, visions through the uh, the weirwoods are somehow corrupted. Like that's not actually what happened. It's possible that's true. You know, it, there's no way to know. Mm. We can't we can't prove it. All the lost future. seeing stones aren't accounted for, Zach. Exactly. Exactly. Lord of the Rings will back. Nice. All right. Okay. Cool. Good. Uh, good times. All right. Uh, any final thoughts on any of these chapters that you guys want to put in before we go? Yeah. Well, this isn't about the, the chapters sort of off topic, but I was watching the news uh, today and Maisie Williams was on it and she was plugging her new company, if anyone's heard of it. Who? Maisie Williams. Oh, OK. What is she doing? She's got this company called Daisy Chain and I didn't really understand too much of it, but I think it's like a social app. You get on there and it connects people, young, fo- um, young filmmakers together. I think that's what oh, it was. Goodness. All these millennials. I can't keep. I can't keep up with the apps. I, know. I don't know. I don't know what apps they're using. I don't so know. many apps. But that's cool for her. That's good. Next episode is going to cover. Let's see. Um, another just a couple more days in February. Doesn't go very far. But it's uh, Brienne three, Ariane one, and John one from A Dance of Dragons. So exciting stuff. I guess a little bit. <laughs> Um, yeah, guess. the VN chapter will be exceptionally exciting. Yeah, that one that one is actually yeah, a great chapter for sure, for sure. I don't even know which one that is. <laughs> we get, we're just going to get known as, as the, uh, the specific character hating podcast, like John at some moments or... <laughs> We don't hate John. But we don't. I love, I some love us, Brienne, but I, just, I like Brienne. Yeah, I love but I mean, Brienne, but her chapters can be. Yeah, yeah there's the one. There's the one that boring. I would not want to read, probably back to back to back. Um, I don't yeah. think I would appreciate that. 
No. So. But but I'm just saying, if you if you'd ask the YouTube, uh, they would they would say that we are constantly hating on on all the characters. <laughs> Why do we well, even read this book if we don't like the characters and stuff? That this I don't is think true. Yeah, be... we we clearly we clearly hate this. That's why we that's why we're doing the reread is because we yeah. hate it. Uh, I mean, I don't know. It, it also you know YouTube comments are very general, and there's like 80 people that are on this, so you know they take something that one person said sometimes and apply it to all of us. It's fine. I mean, you know, everyone's allowed their opinion. It's cool. Yeah. Um, we're just you know I'm still surprised anyone listens honestly. So, Different. and uh, we appreciate it if, you, if you're following at home with us. It's uh, good fun, and we will finish this someday. Yeah. Uh, will Wins of li- Winter be out before we finish our reread? I think that's what we're taking bets on now. Uh, the not. odds. The, yeah, I think the odds are on us at this point. So. So yeah. also, like technically, and on, on a technical side, uh, it's it's still a problem if you can't uh, that you might at some point lose sight of our feed. So if you like, you can uh, click the bell in the. Uh, you get our our uh, feed uh, secured. Also, like, comment, subscribe, all those things. But yeah, the bell thing is oh, actually is that, quite important. What bell? What is this one? Uh, That's uh, it, enlighten no, me. Active, active, you have to go in after you've. Um, you know, subscribed. If you want to subscribe, you don't have to. But if you, when you have done subscribing, there's a little bell, like an annotation, notification. They give you thing. notifications. Oh, yeah. Okay. And if you don't oh, click that, that, then you won't. Uh, then you, you might. Uh, we might get lost from your feed. Yeah, I was unaware of this. Um, all right. So let's see. The other thing. Oh, uh, Ice and Fire Con is coming up in like a month. So this might be out before that. Uh, at the end of it's the end of what is it? The 27th through the 29th, I think, of April. So that looks to be a lot of fun. Uh, I I was planning on going. I don't know if I'm going to make it or not, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, if you're going, uh, I know there will be a bunch of vassals there and a bunch of people from a podcast of Ice and Fire and History of Westeros and everybody. So uh, I'll be there. Yeah. yeah, you'll be there. With that. So there you go. You can meet yeah, Zach, and that's he'll, he'll always sign an your amazing credit card experience. Receipts. Yeah, yeah. So, just incredible. Yeah, it, it looks cool. Really I just like I was gonna book a room, and because I was trying to convince my wife, like you just come up, you know, with the kid, and then we can do stuff around the lake or whatever. <laughs> and she was like, ah, I'm not really into it. So, hmm. it's, 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 like, I, I, I didn't want to book a room just for myself. So, I was like, I don't Yeah, know. I, I basically place. tried the same thing with Acapelicon in Finland when uh, George was coming and was like, So, we can go to f- the, the islands around Finland. They're really nice and stuff like that. Wouldn't you like to go? And she was like, Nah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, Come on, just have a weekend <laughs> off at a, at a cabin or something. Like, come on. But I don't know. It's, it's just as I said, like, Well, you're going to spend most of your times with your friends and not with me. And so, well, which, so is, a, which is a very, a very valid point. But it's like, but, yeah. you got a pool, there's boats. Like there's other stuff to do, mm. but yeah, that's that's very true. It's very true. So. Mm. Wives. All right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, let's see. Bina can edit that out for me. <laughs> I'll uh, see, see see you guys later. Yeah. Bye. Bye. bye.